Okay. <laughs> I need to be able to see the slides to prompt ah, me as okay. I talk. Do you still have two minutes? Yeah. It's recorded on the YouTube. It's streamed on the YouTube. Yeah. So we are watching online. So we have to start with that feature. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Also, you have scarves, so you can give out scarves. Okay, yeah. they are there. I'll, I'll, I'll try and remember to leave nobody, time. For nobody did. I mean, so Science. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that sounds scarves, good. I'll well, see if I can uh, leave enough time. And the only other question, um, just things to remember in case we cannot reach the, 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 the person asking questions, if you can repeat it so that it's yeah, recorded. Sure. People have seen the earlier talk, it will probably help. Great. Well, I think this thing is actually very good for us because I'm also doing it and I'm working with support and stuff. Oh, awesome. So, the heat's kind of complex. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th th this is kind of one of the advanced use cases for heat, so we go into some of the more advanced sort of um, features. But it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be complex for sort of, you know, simple use cases, but it can get complex, I agree. Uh, yeah, the, the one I'm missing here is the dance leader for the next four things. Uh, Dan Sledden was here this week. Is he? Uh, well, he was here for some, some, for some meetings, but um, I, I haven't seen him yet today. I'm not quite sure if he has stuck around. But okay. He was here yesterday, I saw him. So, so he's on the desk now? Or is he uh, So we, we had some meetings at the office for um, the last two days, but um, I, think, uh, I think he should be around. Okay. Hello, guys. Um, just... Uh, it's uh, already time for our next presentation. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Stephen Hardy, Principal Software Engineer from Red Hat United Kingdom. Uh, this next presentation will be about main components of Triple O, and uh, we will have deep dive into uh, heat templates. So it's kind of a follow up uh, on the previous Jay's presentation. So please let me welcome Stephen Hardy. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks for, for all of you for coming. Um, it's good to see so many people interested in hearing about Triple O and deploying OpenStack on OpenStack. Um, where's the switch? Is that working? Uh, how's that? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, let's try that again. So, as you heard in the introduction, um, uh, my name's Steve Hardy, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, and I've been working uh, full time on OpenStack for nearly four years. Um, quite a lot has happened during that time. OpenStack is a very, very fast moving um, project, and um, I'm going to try and give you a bit of an overview of OpenStack, the various components, and we'll go into a bit of detail. Uh, in particular um, on Heat and Triplo, which are the two projects that I'm currently most heavily involved with. Um, so what are we going to talk about here? The majority of it is going to be talking about OpenStack. Um, so it might be worth considering what OpenStack is for a moment. Uh, obviously, it's cloud software, which a lot of people have heard about. Um, but really, it provides you with an abs abstraction layer. So if you have a data center and you want to be able to provide on-demand access to all kinds of different resources, um, 
not only compute resources, running VMs, which is the use case most people tend to think of when it comes to OpenStack, but also storage and virtual networking um, and various other things which we're going to um, uh, talk about in a moment. Um, so we're going to try and give you a, a bit of an overview of OpenStack. We're going to do a bit of a deep dive into some more advanced um, capabilities of heat, and this um, will follow on somewhat from uh, Jay's introductory talk earlier on. So um, it would be good if anyone has, has seen that. If not, you might want to check out the recording um, at a later date. And then we're also going to talk a bit about Ironic, which is um, the bare metal provisioning um, piece of OpenStack, um, and how that can help us with the triple O vision, which is using uh, OpenStack components to deploy OpenStack in a production environment. So a few years ago, OpenStack was uh, very much smaller than it is now. It was primarily focused around um, abstractions for compute, um, and that is mostly running VMs um, across multiple hypervisors, and um, block and object storage. Now, a few short years later, um, there are a large number of different projects. This may not even be accurate, because I did this a few weeks ago. Um, but as you can see, there are um, everything as a service, is the way I like to think of it. Any conceivable abstraction in your data center is likely to have someone working on um, a REST API um, that allows people to more easily interact with uh, those resources. So we're going to focus on uh, Ironic, which allows you to do provisioning of actual bare metal hardware, so dedicated um, bare metal machines um, for your workload rather than VMs. And then we're going to talk about the heat orchestration component, um, which allows you to have a more declarative interface to all of these different tools. Um, you can see that if you've got this proliferation of different HTTP APIs, um, they all follow some common patterns, but they're not necessarily 100% um, uh, consistent. There are different command line tools, although there is a common um, uh, OpenStack client effort going on as well. But really, you need some way which is uh, less imperative to define your resources in your cloud. Um, and as Jay's talk um, introduced earlier on, there's a template uh, model, which he accepts, which allows you to define um, relationships between your different um, resources um, and instantiate them in the right order for you without you necessarily having to worry about dependencies between components explicitly yourself. So before we get into the details of the orchestration features themselves, it's worth kind of differentiating a little bit between orchestration and config management. Um, this is kind of a bit of a blurry line, particularly in um, the cloud world, because there's a number of different uh, config management tools that provide some um, orchestration capabilities, and then there's some more orchestration-focused tools which do have built-in uh, config management capabilities. So Heat tries to draw a fairly um, defined line uh, between those two um, features. Um, we don't have any built-in uh, software configuration uh, capability, but we have um, uh, implementation agnostic way to drive existing config management tools. So we'll get into a bit more detail about that, um, but I just wanted to clarify that, you know, it's not a replacement for Puppet or Ansible or anything like that. Um, it's really about organizing and uh, managing your interactions between different services on OpenStack. So um, to follow on from, from Jay's um, introduction earlier on, the instantiated environment for Heat is, um, is a stack. And so that's the name for the resources which have been deployed for you by Heat based on uh, the YAML template that you have fed in. Um, if you're at all familiar with CloudFormation, similar kind of concept. Um, we have a native um, template language in addition to capabilities to drive um, uh, cloud formation templates. Um, and another really nice feature of Heat um, is that there's a very easy way to compose multiple fragments of your environment. So you can define a Heat template that contains, say, um, some particular piece of software and the server um, resource that is going to host it, perhaps some networking to support it, um, some particular type of storage, and that can be a unit that is then easily reused. Um, the templates are all parameterized, um, and as Jay introduced earlier on, there's a the concept of an environment. So say if you need a staging workflow and you need some different parameters or, or even nested, different nested stack implementations between, say, pre-production and development and production environments, um, it's very easy to do that with um, a maximum amount of reuse. So this is just a very quick example. Try not to overlap too much with the earlier talk, but it's going to help with the, the concepts we discuss later. Um, when we talk about co composability, we're really talking about referencing one heat template in another template. So it's kind of a parent-child relationship. 
Um, so in this case, we've got a parent template which is referencing an OpenStack controller um, type alias. Um, and that is just a way of referencing this server with controller config.yaml. And the way which you will create that is to reference the resource registry, which is just a mapping between um, an alias and uh, an implementation. Um, so you do your stack create, pass in a template and an environment file, and those two combine to fully define what's going to be deployed um, in your cloud. So once you've got your unit of deployment sorted out and you've got something that works really, really well, pretty much immediately the next thing you're going to need to do is to build lots of them. Um, you know, you're going to need to scale out horizontally when your application becomes successful because you're going to need to handle an increased load. So there's a couple of different ways of doing that um, within Heat. Um, the one which I'm going to talk about primarily today is the resource group abstraction. And this just provides a really easy way of saying, make me however many of a particular resource type. And so you can combine that with uh, the composability we just talked about and just scale out a Heat template um, to any number depending on the capabilities of the cloud you're deploying onto. There's also an auto-scaling group resource, um, which has um, integration with um, accelerometer alarms, um, and that allows you to do much more event-driven scale-out. Um, but we're going to talk about the more static um, grouping uh, method today. So you've got your server stood up. Perhaps you've got some storage. You've got some networking set up. The next thing you're going to need to do, as we discussed earlier on in terms of config management, is deploy some application onto the, onto the hardware. Um, the way you do this in the heat model is basically you define a software config resource in your YAML template. And this doesn't care what tool you use. Um, it just accepts, for example, a Puppet manifest or an Ansible playbook or a shell script or a Python script or whatever it is that you want to run on your server. Um, you then reference that from a software deployment resource, and this is the thing that actually runs your config. This is the thing that knows how to associate that piece of configuration um, with a particular server. And there's a singling me mechanism, which is using some agents inside um, the instance, um, which basically knows how to collect that configuration, run it on, on the, the node in question, and then send a signal back when it's done, or if it fails. And we collect the standard out, the standard uh, and the return code of whatever it is that you run. And um, the nice thing then is, you know, it's well integrated with the templates. You don't have to do um, a handoff to another tool, although you could do if you wanted to. You could deploy with Heat and then configure with Ansible or a Puppet Master or whatever. But particularly in the case where you want to scale out, it's more convenient if you can define everything in one place and then just multiply up the environment as it grows. So another common requirement um, if you're deploying a more complex application, and in particular OpenStack, which is what we're going to be talking about uh, deploying in a moment or two, is configuring each individual node is not enough. Each individual node can be set up, but then they need to be configured to know about all of the other nodes. And so I'm calling this cluster configuration because that's effectively what we're talking about. You deploy a cluster of near identical nodes, um, or completely identical, and then they need to be wired up so they can talk to each other. And the example um, we're going to talk about today is um, OpenStack controller nodes, where you install a bunch of API services and um, a bunch of RPC and database components, and all of them need to be wired together. Otherwise, they're not going to cooperate and uh, increase your capacity as a whole. So you've got this nice configuration method. You've got your template sorted out. You can deploy um, your workload on a virtual environment, and you're happy that it works great. But a lot of people have requirements for better performance. Um, and this is where ironic bare metal provisioning comes in. So this is an OpenStack API that um, basically makes bare metal provisioning possible in a, in a way that's very, very similar to um, deploying virtual machines via the Nova compute service. And in fact, it has a driver such that you deploy something in the exact same way that you deploy a VM. And then what you end up with is, is a bare metal machine. So um, the key difference between this and more traditional provisioning methods is that you don't run an installer. You prepare an image ahead of time, and then you basically deploy that image onto the bare metal node, um, and then you're basically ready to go. Um, the advantages of there are, you know, in some cases, performance, uh, but in, in terms of trying to make sure that all of the nodes are exactly the same um, and managing drift between different nodes, this can be a nice method as well. So, there's quite a lot of support from the hardware vendor community. Um, 
Ironic is proving to be quite a successful project. Um, and so that's quite a good motivator if you want to build a deployment tool, if you already have built-in support for a bunch of different hardware. Um, and so that's one reason why uh, Triplo uses Ironic for bare metal provisioning, because it has very good pluggable support for different, um, different hardware types. So hopefully you can see that OK. Um, this is just a diagram which tries to um, give you a bit more of a granular view of how things work inside Ironic. And so as I mentioned, so the Nova API in OpenStack is the compute interface. Traditionally, you would use that to launch VMs on, say, a KVM or Zen hypervisor uh, compute node. But in this case, it's configured instead so the Nova scheduler knows how to talk to the Ironic API. And the user comes along and says, OK, I want a server running this image. And the flavor is a configuration that um, points to a bare metal resource type. Um, and so it works in a very similar way to starting a VM only we have an extra step because the ironic conductor needs to know how to power on the, the physical hardware. And then we do that via um, uh, a plugin of some sort. And in this case, um, I'm illustrating you might have an IPMI um, interface. Uh, that's quite, quite obviously quite a common standard, um, which would know how to talk to your hardware and turn it on. And perhaps do some other actions as well. So you power on your node and then um, the Ironic service is able to PXE boot um, a RAM disk onto that node, which then pulls down the image which you want to put onto the node. There's some code in the RAM disk that knows how to deploy that onto the local disk. Then it reboots the node, and then it comes up with the image that you want to be running. So that, in a nutshell, is what Ironic does for you. Um, and the key advantages, as I mentioned, are the pluggability um, and the driver support that you get for free if you choose to use it. So um, <coughs> Triplo is choosing to use Ironic. Um, several other deployment tools um, inside the open OpenStack space and elsewhere, um, such as Bifrost, um, are using it as well. Um, and so it's proving to be uh, quite a nice solution um, for these sorts of bare metal provisioning cases. So this brings me on to um, the integration of these, uh, these, these two pieces. So when you have a heat environment um, and uh, bare metal provisioning capability. Um, you can then deploy a complex workload. Um, and OpenStack is one of the more complex workloads you can consider. As I mentioned at the start of the talk, um, things are moving very, very fast. Um, and there's a lot of um, relatively complex distributed applications that all need to be configured in subtly different ways. And so you need a flexible and repeatable way to deploy um, that workload. The exact same problem exists for many other kinds of workloads, um, but Triplo is focused solely on deploying OpenStack um, on physical hardware. Um, so it's a bit of a weird concept. It's kind of the chicken and the egg kind of thing. You, you, you start off with an OpenStack environment, and you end up with another OpenStack environment. Um, <coughs> you can reasonably ask the question, how do you get the first OpenStack environment? The answer is, at the moment, we have um, some scripts that do a single node install and configure OpenStack on one node uh, using Puppet. And then the exact same Puppet implementation is used to configure the OpenStack services on the production cloud. And so we've adopted some terminology here, um, which um, is worth kind of um, remembering because it ends up being in quite a lot of documentation and um, blog posts and things related to Triple O. So the deployment cloud is called the undercloud. Um, and this is basically uh, the small OpenStack that is used to bootstrap your production OpenStack. And then the overcloud is the production uh, cloud that you would um, then deploy. At the moment, um, the tooling expects you to only deploy one production cloud. Uh, in the future, there's no technical reason why, other than the, probably a few hard-coded assumptions, that you couldn't deploy uh, multiple overclouds. And that's definitely something which we would be looking to um, support uh, more completely in the future. Um, you can imagine that would be particularly nice in a developer environment where uh, you know, developers might want um, their own test environment, which is separate from other, um, other users doing testing, um, or in a pre-production test environment. I think that could be very useful in terms of um, the sort of staging workflow that you end up needing before rolling out things to production. So you have your deployment and management tooling in your small OpenStack. And then you have um, your OpenStack production cloud um, which is the thing that is actually deployed by your undercloud. So if we go back to some of the heat concepts we kind of looked at very briefly a few minutes ago, 
um, that is grouping of uh, resources, composability, um, which is the nested stacks, a stack which references another stack, and the software configuration, um, we can see a bit more concretely how those features combine to make um, this kind of deployment possible. So we, the undercloud is deploying groups of nodes, and um, unsurprisingly, seeing as I've already talked about this resource group abstraction inside Heat, we make use of that in order to deploy however many controllers you want. For instance, you will probably deploy three if you want uh, an HA deployment, um, and however many computes you want, which is basically the hypervisor nodes that support the deployment of VMs. And there's three different types of storage node. So you can deploy um, Ceph storage nodes, which have the Ceph, um, the Ceph OSD uh, component on it, uh, Swift storage nodes, which allow you to scale out your object storage, um, and block storage nodes, which is basically if you have um, a requirement for a basic um, Cinder storage implementation and you choose not to back um, Cinder by, um, by Ceph. So we've now got multiple resource groups, and you can imagine these are all in one template. Um, and that's actually how we do do it. We've got an overcloud YAML template, um, which defines a number of groups of nodes, and you say how many of each you want. And then we create some nested stack templates which define each node. And that goes away, and it creates an OS Nova server. And as we've discovered, if you have Nova configured to create bare metal nodes via Ironic, um, you can just go away and deploy on bare metal. So we're making use of, uh, of that integration. Um, and then we're making use of the software configuration um, interface of Heat um, to, in some cases, run scripts to prepare the network, and in a lot of cases, run Puppet um, in standalone masterless mode. So that's kind of a weird concept until you get your head around it. There is no Puppet master, and all of the data um, used for Puppet um, is coming from Heat. And the way we handle that is basically the first thing we do before running any Puppet on the nodes is we deploy some higher data. Um, and if anyone knows Puppet, um, you, know, you probably will know more about um, the details of higher data than I do. But um, we deploy a big map of higher data key value pairs, and then we run Puppet in a series of passes um, uh, on the nodes in order to get the services fully configured. So this is an illustration of that process. This is not every step that we run, um, because I wouldn't be able to fit it on one slide. But it hopefully gives you um, uh, an idea of the, of the conceptual process. So the first step, as on the previous slide, is you deploy the server, you do the initial configuration of each unit, um, which is being scaled out. And then the next step is you do a number of configuration passes doing the cluster-wide configuration, um, which is uh, the interface which I described earlier on using the OS Heat software deployment group. Um, and each one of those accepts a configuration which is, in most cases, a puppet manifest. Um, Everything's wired in in a bit of a kind of um, uh, puppet-centric way in the default implementation, but we've been careful to keep the abstractions in place such that other um, deployment solutions would be easily plugged in. And in fact, there's an effort going on at the moment to deploy via Docker containers using um, uh, the Collar containers, which is the, um, one of the container communities within OpenStack. Um, and uh, they've been very um, easily able to wire in deploying via Docker instead of having to use Puppet to configure the services. So um, the point being that if people are sufficiently motivated, they could wire in using any config tool they are, they are invested in. Um, but we've chosen to use Puppet as a first step because of uh, prior experience using that tool. So this is a slightly more granular model, um, which kind of combines the workflow we described for Ironic and um, the AAA deployment workflow. So you have um, an interface to deploy your cloud. That passes in some templates and some puppet manifests into Heat. And Heat then basically builds a big dependency graph. Um, and this is kind of the main thing that Heat does. Um, it, it really cares about dependencies between different components. And it passes the YAML model. And then inside um, the Heat engine, you end up with a dependency graph, which we then know how to walk in a certain order, such that you create things um, in the right sequence. Um, but as a user or an operator, you don't have to care about that explicitly um, unless there is nothing in the template 
um, which references between those two resources. So Jay earlier on mentioned there's a depends on directive. If, for example, you were just creating two completely independent servers and for some reason you knew they had to be created in a certain order, you can control that. But in most cases, you don't have to care about that um, explicitly. And so um, the other thing that we're making quite heavy use of in O at this point in time is Neutron. Um, we're primarily using that as an IP address management solution. Um, there's been some really good work done on um, uh, network isolation. So this is quite a common requirement for production um, OpenStack workloads um, where you want to deploy and keep, say, the storage traffic separate from the compute traffic or the management traffic separate from some other category of traffic. And so there are a number of predefined overlay networks that can be defined um, and we use Neutron um, to handle that. So, got a few minutes left. I'm going to attempt to run a demo. Um, this is going to be live, and I'm running bleeding edge upstream code. So there's, there's every chance it could go wrong. But um, I'm going to run this. It also runs quite slowly on my laptop. So what I might do is talk through a few things and get it up and running. And then we can break for questions. And then, um, providing it doesn't fail horribly, we can go back and look at the result um, at the end of the talk. So, as you may have noticed, I didn't come in with a rack of bare metal hardware. So, um, my workaround for that is um, to use virtual machines, which are configured to pretend to be bare metal. Um, and Ironic has been configured um, to drive these um, basically via PXE, and then there's a PXE SSH driver, um, which basically uses SSH between the RAM disk um, and the Ironic service to control things. So, this is not representative of how you would do a real hardware deployment, um, but it's a reasonable approximation for these purposes. And um, this is also the same environment that most folks would use for development, unless they happen to have access to a bare metal testing lab. And you'll notice that there's one VM already up and running. So we've talked about the undercloud, the, the management node, um, the small open stack, however you want to think about it. Um, just so happens that for reasons related to the tooling we use to, to create it, um, we call that instack. Um, and if you create a default um, environment using uh, upst upstream triple or also um, the RDO community um, have uh, the RDO manager tool, which is based on triple O. Um, they're both nice ways to get up and running um, using, uh, using triple O, depending on how bleeding edge you feel like you want to be. Um, and in this case, the instack node is the undercloud. So I've got a shell window on here. And let's have a quick look at some of the services which are running on here. So, um, Ironic represents the bare metal nodes. We've registered three um, nodes here. And these are these uh, three VMs which are pretending to be bare metal. Um, at the moment, they're all in a state of power off and provisioning state available. So that basically means they can be accessed by the Nova scheduler and uh, they're available to be uh, provisioned to. We can see there's nothing running uh, in Nova yet. And so as we talked about earlier on, there's this flow between Nova as the user facing abstraction and the API that launches the nodes, even though they're bare metal, and Ironic, which is the back end that manages the actual hardware deployment itself. And so um, heat is the orchestration tool that's used to drive the whole process, and we haven't got any stacks up and running at the moment. So in order to make life um, easier for operators, you can drive this directly via a heat command. It's a bit inconvenient unless you're um, a developer. So there's an OpenStack client plugin, and uh, it's as simple as doing this. If you want to deploy an overcloud, you do OpenStack overcloud deploy, and then in my case, I've made a copy of um, the heat <coughs> templates used to do the deployment to my local um, directory. If you don't specify a location, um, it will just use a default location, which is user share, OpenStack, triple uh, heat templates. OK, so this is where I cross my fingers, and I hope it all works fine. <coughs> so you can see there, there is a warning, because I haven't um, uh, told. Uh, I haven't tagged any of these nodes in Ironic to say that they're going to be a controller or compute. They're just generic nodes. 
Um, that's actually uh, just a warning. Um, and so it's going to go through and it's going to pick um, at random two of these nodes. The default is one controller and one compute. Um, I would run more, but I'll run out of RAM. Um, and then we get a lot of um, fairly verbose event listings. So these are events that are coming straight out of heat. Um, and it gives you a nice view of the progress of the deployment. Um, unfortunately, they're getting a bit uh, chopped by the resolution of the screen. So I don't think there's much I can do about that without making it too small. Um, but basically, it's going to go through and it's going to create a group of nested stacks. Each one contains one server and some software configuration. And then it's going to create a bunch of resources in Neutron. And then it's going to um, do a bunch of configuration passes with Puppet. And then, if nothing goes wrong, it will all be completed and we'll have a running OpenStack environment. So I've got another window here so we can just watch things um, as they progress. So we can see now that um, OpenStack over cloud deploy command has gone through and it's created a heat stack. And this is going to stay create in progress until such time as all of those nested stacks and all the configuration steps have been completed. Um, and when it goes to create complete, that means that basically your OpenStack deployment is completed. So similar to Jay's demonstration earlier on, he did a resource listing of the heat stack. And so you can see there's quite a lot more in this case um, because it's a much bigger template. And you can see that there's a bunch of uh, random script string uh, resources, um, a bunch of virtual IP um, resources, and a series of uh, config resources that are used to configure the nodes. Um, if we now look in Nova... <coughs> So we can see that um, Nova has launched two nodes, which ordinarily you would expect to be VMs, but because of the way which we've configured things, it's talking to Ironic, and it's going to spawn two bare metal nodes, which are, again, these two nodes, which are configured to be dummy bare metal, um, for want of a better description. So we've started these two nodes. They're currently booting. They have already booted the RAM disk. Uh, and have deployed a CentOS image which contains all of the OpenStack packages. So, so here we can see um, Ironic has powered on two of the nodes picked um, by the Nova scheduler and um, we're going to have to wait a few minutes whilst this goes through, and then uh, the puppet configuration and um, other resources within the heat stack um, get created. So thank you very much. Um, we've got uh, 10 minutes to go, and I know, having tested this earlier on, that it's likely to take um, most of the remaining 10 minutes. So I would suggest maybe we break for a few minutes for questions now, um, and then uh, if we have time, I'll uh, come back to this in a minute. Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, in this case, there's a tool, a script called Instack Vert Setup. It's in the Triple O documentation and the RDO Manager documentation. Um, it goes through and basically uses Vert to create um, the VMs. Um, and then it creates a configuration file, which is just a JSON map, which contains the details required, an SSH key and an IP address, basically. Um, for real bare metal, you would create that JSON file manually. And it would create, you would need things like, um, well, at, at a minimum, you need the IPMI credentials. Um, but you may well choose to put other details, such as MAC addresses and things in there. Um, in terms of discovery, you need to be a bit careful about the definition. So we can't just go out and um, automatically discover um, uh, random nodes on the network. You need to at least provide the IPMI credentials. But having done that, um, there's another part of the process that I haven't talked about today, which is doing node introspection. And this uses the um, Ironic Discover D, sorry, Ironic Inspector um, service. Um, and so this has been developed um, closely with the Ironic community. And it uses a similar process to the deployment, where it boots a special RAM disk. 
and then it runs um, a, a bunch of introspection tests and then pushes the, the, the data back, um, which is then used to populate things like the amount of RAM in Ironic. So um, the answer is um, yes in terms of introspection, but you, you do need to manually um, in, in input the inventory for the nodes. Yeah, so, so, so Dimitri um, is, is um, one of the main developers uh, on the Ironic Inspector project, and uh, thanks for the clarification. It sounds like discovery um, will be a future feature, um, so that's something to keep an eye out for. Any more questions? Do you do any kind of um, tree or something to fan out? Do you do, you do any kind of um, fan out to keep like the glance images and the pixies from all saturating nodes? I mean, is that part of the orchestration you do? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure if um, Ironic um, will put in like a random factor itself. It's not something that we do within the triple O code itself. It, Again, that's something which um, Dimitri may, may be able to answer. It doesn't like cascade? Of, um, yeah, when, when, when you're booting like 100 nodes or 200 nodes from a certain amount of images through a certain number of pixie nodes, you can overwhelm them unless you do some kind of cascading or is there any kind of clever way to not overwhelm some of the source nodes? Yes, thanks. Uh, you mean uh, overloading network for PXC requests or overloading land service? So first of all, we're using IPXC by default, which is uh, HTTP based, so it's not that bad. It's TFTP based PXC. Uh, this process itself doesn't have any batching other than that. And as to deploying process itself, there are two options actually in Ironic. You can directly deploy every node from Glance, uh, which is essentially not from Glance, but from Swift temp URL, and you can scale Swift pretty well. Or the second option, which is default for triple O, is uh, <coughs> each node is exposed as an iSCSI share and is deployed from uh, Ironic conductor. So. The, the former option, which is not default, is probably b much better at scaling. That's, I know some people are using. Uh, we can support both, we just don't pre-configure it. I mean, <coughs> in my experience, the way which people tend to want to deploy is start off with a relatively small deployment and then scale out. But you're right, if you wanted to deploy hundreds or thousands of compute nodes, for example, at once, um, you might need to... There, there are several interfaces um, to the triple heat templates that allow you to override um, and provide... Um, uh, custom configuration, and you might do something like having a, a script that runs on all the nodes and waits for a, a, you know, a random amount of time. Um, so there, there's certainly, you know, in addition to the scalability um, configuration that uh, Dimitri mentioned, there's, there's ways that you could do that if you, um, you know, if you had a reason to, to, to deploy a very, very large environment in one go. Um, okay, so only a few minutes left. Any more questions? So, uh, yeah, so, so the question was, if the undercloud, the in-stack node, uh, fails, um, will the overcloud be impacted? And the answer is, no, it will be fine. Um, although, if you were in the middle of doing a deployment, um, you know, you probably would be in an incomplete state. Um, but we've got documented procedures for backing up um, the undercloud node. And if you had some kind of a disaster, you would restore everything from backups, um, including the database contents, and then you would be able to continue managing um, the cloud, which is currently deployed. There are no um, requirements for the undercloud to be continually running um, whilst the overcloud um, is deployed. So providing you haven't got an in-progress action, you can take the undercloud down for maintenance. Perhaps if you need to do an upgrade of the undercloud to a new version, that's perfectly fine. You just need to schedule an outage window, make sure that no one's doing anything uh, in terms of configuring the overcloud, and then you can take it down and everything will keep running absolutely fine. kind of uh, a hard um, node types, like a uh, data type? Or so by default, uh, they are, but uh, they don't have to be. So in, in case anyone didn't hear, the, the, the question was, uh, is the image deployed on the nodes the same for all the, different, uh, for all the different types? So you can specify a different image per role. So for example, the OpenStack controllers versus the OpenStack computes. 
um, you do expect to be able to use the same image within a given group. So if you had completely different architectures of hardware um, within, say, your compute group, that could be a problem. Um, so we don't currently support mixing you know, totally different um, architectures. Um, but if you had a requirement for a different image um, between, say, the controller nodes and the computes, that would be perfectly fine. By default, we just build one, uh, which contains everything now. Any more questions at all? Okay, that's probably the last one, and then we'll quickly see whether this... Uh, uh, is it possible right. to associate before the overcloud deploy um, an ironic node to a host name? So I w to say this MAC address or this CPMI node is overcloud controller zero, one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is this new? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, I've actually got a documentation patch up at the moment for Triple O Docs, which hasn't yet landed. Um, so there's two different ways of achieving that, depending on how much control you require. You can either tag um, a, a subset of the nodes in Ironic with, say, this is a controller, and then you can guarantee it's always going to be a controller, perhaps because you know your controller nodes have more or less memory or something, or you know your Ceph nodes have a particular disk configuration. Um, and that is data that can be derived from uh, the node introspection process. And then we've got some tools that allow you to have matching rules, so you can have some automatically applied tags. But I think your question is more granular. If you want to say, this node will always be controller zero, and the way which we do that is you, again, assign um, a capability to each node in Ironic, which might be node controller zero, and then you use Nova scheduler hints to basically force Nova to always pick that node. Um, and yeah, we've got a documentation patch up for that at the moment. Um, in, the, in the future, there might be a more direct way of doing it, but Nova scheduler hints provides a, a workable solution at this point. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to have a quick look and see whether this is progressed enough for us to see any more. Unfortunately, I think it may be running too slowly. OK, well, I'm sorry, but it looks like the, uh, the demo is going to take a bit too long to run due to being uh, overloading my poor laptop. Um, we could probably take, well, I think we're actually out of time. So I think uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But thank you for listening, and I hope that was useful. Now, isn't it? Like one yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, on my test machine at home, it takes like eight minutes to deploy, but as a bit of a faster machine, I think this we, is we got the same issue. We we have laptops, and just you know, it's not easy to install under cloud and over cloud in it if you have yeah. 12 gigs of memory. It's not even, I mean, you, no, you, you need, need two least. gigs for the under cloud, yeah. I think a minimum, yeah. and then you need for the over cloud. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's this is 16 stretch. gigs and it's only just enough, but at home I've got a 32 gig box and it still works a bit easier. But um, we're, we're looking at ways of trying to reduce the RAM requirement. Uh, we have some uh, happy guy from uh, NA who is now trying to install it, uh, the undercloud and the overcloud on his laptop. He's very uh, optimistic about it, so we will see. Can you uh, copy the presentation? So
was very like without discussion <laughs> about uh, the uh, differences. No, the differences without the discussion. Well, it was very interesting. Uh, without debating on which is better. Yeah, <laughs> we're not gonna do that. Thank you very much. Yeah, so. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? Steve. Nice meeting you. I think we've spoken on the phone before. Ah, cool. About Swift. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm in on Triple O. Oh, good. Well, okay, I'll let you get on with it. Good luck. Well, the battery is low anyway. So uh, it will last. I mean, he will use this. And this is enough for the presentation. This should be enough. One yeah, yeah. And then we need to find. After that, we will put it in the chat. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do, but with two presentations.